and it's, I, I've just had a cursory look at some of Jan Khotun's poems. And the poem that you translated as her anger, begrudging, um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, unhappiness towards her beloved, that he does not acknowledge this uh, uh, bond that they have. And it really, it reminded me immediately of Saadi's mm -hmm. poem that starts with, Man nadon estam az avval ke to bi mehr vafai ah no vastan az on beh ke be bandi o nafai and i find it just as you know heart wrenching perhaps from him um and there there are a lot of her there is always a wink and a nod as you said to the predecessors the anxiety of influence to borrow a phrase but you know, there is a lot of Hafez. And I also wanted, towards the end, when you mentioned about the ambiguity of gender, if we believe that Mahsati and Ganjavi's poems are her own, then there mm -hmm. is a lot of sure. gender specific. That's true. Sort of, you know, the anatomy makes it clear. But, anyways, <laughs> enough of me. I have another thing, but I'll bring it to the modern Can period. I, I shouldn't. Can I respond uh, very briefly. Um, I, I would, I would, my response, I, I, of course, I, I agree, I agree with what Nagas has just said. I should have said, um, as you can tell, I, I, I did this talk from, from notes. I, Jahan Khatun has been in my head so much recently, because I've just published some translations of her, that I thought I am not going to write out another lecture on Jahan Khatun. I'm, she's in my head, I'm going to do it from notes. I should have mentioned this. Um, Jahan Khatun, I said that she echoes uh, Hafez, which she does. She also, she also echoes Khadju a couple of times. Um, but she actually says, she says in one of her poems that her model is Saadi. And she echoes Saadi more than anybody else. And in fact, if we can, although she echoes Hafez and, and Khadju, but Hafez more than Khadju, although she echoes them, her writing is very different from theirs. Um, Khadju, let's, let's stick with Hafez. Hafez's writing is famously dense. It's every rift loaded with ore, as Keats says. There's, every phrase can be parsed in different ways. Uh, Hafez is always trying to say two or three things at the same time, uh, or saying two or three things at the same time. Jahan Khatun says one thing at a time. Uh, her poetry is very clear, it's very elegant. It tries for a kind of elegant simplicity. It tries for, in fact, what Saadi was famous for, which was Sahle um, Momtana, this difficult simplicity, this, this simplicity which is almost impossible, which seems so easy, but it's all, almost impossible to imitate. And in fact, in her best poems, in her most beautiful poems, she achieves this, I think. She has this, this, this simplicity which seems astonishing because it, it's so clear, it's so simple. It's like that Saadi poem. And yet, you try and do it, mate. It's really, really hard to do. Sure, absolutely. And we should perhaps mention that... Uh, um, the translations that you were reading were from your latest book, yeah. um, which I definitely recommend, Faces of Beloved? Or, it's, it's called Faces, Faces of, of Love. Of love. Th yeah, this yeah. is the Penguin edition, which I think is not out in England yet. It's, it's, out in, it's out in the States. The hardback edition is out in England, but it's terribly expensive. This will be out in England in February, so I would hang on to a February. Oh, it's yeah. Faces of Love. It's Hafez. It's, it, the, there are translations of Hafez. It's about 70 ghazals by Hafez and a few Rabayat. Uh, uh, Obey, um, uh, Jahan, about 60 poems by Jahan, and Obeyed, including some of his most scabrous obscene poems, and including also uh, Cat and Mouse, which is this satire about the takeover of Shiraz by Mubarez al-Din, which is a very funny poem. It's the most famous pre-modern Persian political satire. Um, so that's in there too. So it's, it's mainly Hafez, some Jahan Khatun, and a kind of sprinkling of Obeyed at the end. Of course, Qobus Nome has a good um, uh, recipe for you know, good health, uh, sure. on the, which season you should sleep with what sex, and yes, that you, he, he says, conducive he says, to... You sleep you with know. girls in the winter and boys that's in the summer. That's right, I'm, if I'm you don't sure want why, to get high just... blood pressure. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Anyway, a question, Anthony, please, at the back. Uh, at the, right, at the back. Nick, that was just the perfect lecture that makes one just want to go and read these poems over and Good over again. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, which I mean, read the poems. Well, that really brings it to my question. Can you tell us something about the circumstances, the social circumstances in which Jahan Khartoun's poems were read? Did people just read them privately or 
I mean, the poem of Hafiz, you can sit around, you have a dore, mushari, gentlemen can sit around, but her poems, I suspect, could not be read by gentlemen, as it were. So how were they read? That, well, the short answer, Anthony, is that we don't know, but we can speculate. We, know, we do know that the women had relative freedom at the Inju court. It seems to me that uh, somebody who was... I mean, Jahan Khatun's divan is very large. She obviously spent a long time writing poetry, and from the evidence of her preface, it was something that was very important to her. She, I mean, she really thought of it as what she would leave to the world, and that the world, she hoped, would remember her because she'd written these poems. So it was a big thing in her life. If a woman had access to her uncle's court, and it was so important in her life, I can't imagine that she would stay away when Hafez was at the court, for example. And I feel certain that she would appear when Hafez was there. Perhaps they even spoke to each other. That wouldn't be impossible in that court. It probably would be in, in later other courts. There is actually a novel by Pesach Saad in which he imagines them having a love affair. This certainly did not happen. But uh, anyway, um, it's a charming novel, though. Um, there's also an, a novel by a, a German novelist who does the same thing. I, I've forgotten her name, which I haven't read. Um, we don't know what, 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 the, what the situation was. What we can say is that she became quite famous in her own time as a poet, which meant that her poems were read beyond the immediate confines of the court. For a couple of hundred years after her death, she gets mentioned in biographical notices. You know, this, this um, Tazkirat tradition of, of writing uh, books which are collections of, of biographies of poets with the odd quotation. She's mentioned in those Tazkirat for uh, um, two or three hundred years after her death. So obviously her poems did have some fame, which meant that they traveled beyond, beyond the court. There is also a tradition, though it doesn't appear uh, until 200 years after her death, so it might be an invention, but there was a tradition that she had a kind of salon in which she invited poet, poets to compete, and she was the kind of presiding judge at, 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 the, at these poetic gatherings. Of course, those poetic gatherings were very common uh, in the Middle Ages, and they still are in Iran. Uh, they always have been. But, um, of course, the distinctive thing is here that, that they were presided over by a woman. But this, this tradition does exist, that she had such a salon in which poets came and read their poems to each other, and, and she was the kind of person who gave the prize, as it were. And she read her own poems. So certainly her poems were read within the court. Her poems were known within the court. The, the, the two poems that are about her, whether they're by Obeid or not, they obviously show that they weren't just read by women, because these poems are certainly by a man, probably by Obeid, and so her poems got beyond the immediate circle of the kind of women of the court. Um, she seems to have hoped for fame. There are four manuscripts of her poems. Two of them seem to have been written almost at the same time. They're in the same hand, uh, and um, presumably towards the end of her life. Uh, and it's assumed that, or it's guessed, that, that she supervised this, that she, she wanted her poems to go out into the world. Um, it, was, it was less anomalous for a woman at the Inju court to do this kind of thing than it would have been at most courts at that time. She's very lucky in that way, that she, she was a princess at such a court. But it was still anomalous. So I think her poems rather probably had a kind of over to the edge of poetic activity existence, but they were known about by people who cared about poetry. And the evidence for this is that she gets mentioned in these, in these biographies of poets later on. <clears throat> um, now, uh, Stefan Schperl and then Dr. Goldschwein. On first, Stefan, please, right in front. Just wanted to know, to, to what extent does religion or mysticism play any role in Jehan Khatun's poetry? That's a very interesting question. It's especially interesting because of she was clearly she clearly knew Hafez. She quotes Hafez, and of course the question of mysticism up are, are, are Hafez's poems mystical or not? Some are clearly mystical, some are clearly not mystical, and then there's an awful lot of poems which seem to be both secular and mystical. Hafez, and I, as I said, Hafez often seems to be trying to say at least two things at once, and sometimes it's a mystical statement, and sometimes it's a secular statement in the same poem, as it were. You can have poems which can be read in either way. That, Hafez is famous for this. And there are many poems like that. There are virtually no poems by Jahan Khartoun like, like in this way. It, it, to my knowledge, she only mentions Sufism once. And I will read the poem in which she mentions it. Um, and she mentions it flippantly. This is, this is my translation of it. I swore I'd never look at him again. I'd be a Sufi, deaf to sin's temptations. I saw my nature wouldn't stand for it. From now on, I renounce renunciations. So that's her take on Sufism, the hell with it. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, she does have a number of poems 
uh, very despairing poems, in fact, which I, one guesses were written at the end of her life, in which she says, the world has treated me so badly, and people have treated me so badly, that I turn to God. But they're not mystical poems. They, they're very much poems within... They're, 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 they're traditional devotional poems. There's no sense of Erfan in them at all. Um, they're, they're, they're just traditionally religious. I turn to God and God will save me, I hope. She admonishes herself to pray. She has a number of poems in which she tells herself to pray. Um, and I, one presumes, because those, those poems always have a kind of ground base of, I love the world, the world has, has treated me wretchedly, I turn to God, that's all I have left. But it's not in a mystical sense. It, it's in a, a, a strictly orthodox religious sense, as far as one can see. Uh, you, in the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned that the Persian poets talk about themselves too much, brag about themselves too much. But I think when the era of the Aside was over, 12th and 13th century, uh, during the Ghazal period, 14th century on, onward, uh, poets, they didn't brag themselves about themselves too much. Uh, in Hafez, for example, I, I find only one uh, Ghazal he talked about himself too much. Manam ke shohre shaharam be ishq barzidan. Manam ke dide na yaludam be vad idan. Manam, manam. In one Ghazal, Hafez did that. But the rest of it, he's, he's, he's very humble. Well, I, the only thing I would say, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Ghazal day, because in fact, one can see that this convention, it comes from the Ghazidei. The Ghazidei is, is a praise poem, and it ends with the name of the ruler, and praise surrounds the name of the ruler. Um, but, and then the Ghazal, which grows out of the Ghazidei, it's, it's kind of the lyrical introduction, as you know, to the Ghazidei, which then is an independent form by itself. It ends with the name of the poet instead of the name of the praise person. But praise was naturally attached to that name with which a poet ended, and so praise tends to get to be attached to the name of the poet. Uh, with, with, which, with, with which the poem ends. I, Hafez, I, I, I think there are more examples than you say of, of Hafez. I mean, Hafez does often end a poem saying, I'm a damn good poet. I, I mean, the, the fact that, the fact that um, there is a special name for doing this in Persian indicates that it was quite common. I mean, the name is Fakhr. Uh, it's Fekhere. Um, the fact that it's called Fakhr indicates that it exists, that Persians were expected to boast. And in fact, I would say also that this exists in, in medieval European poetry too. Medieval, and the, the reason it exists is it's, it's court poetry. The poet is asking for patronage. The poet, the poet is, he, he makes his money by being patronized by somebody. And he's saying to the king, look, I'm a damn good poet. Um, and as I say, this exists in medieval um, court poetry in Europe as well, in Christendom. Um, Saadi is, is, is quite insistent that Saadi is a very good poet indeed. It's true that Hafez, I, I, I will grant what you say, and that Hafez is much more, Hafez is constantly ambiguous. And sometimes when he's boasting, he seems to be poking fun at himself. You're not, you're not sure if it's a boast or if, it, or if it's a don't be silly Hafez. There is an ambiguity in the way Hafez does it. But it, is, it was a convention. And as I say, it's a convention that had a name. The fact that it had a name, I think, indicates its existence. What I, the point I was trying to make is that no matter how, uh, how slightly any given poet seems to indulge in that convention, Jahan Khatun, as far as I remember, never does. Her poems very often, uh, she, uh, as, as you will know, uh, and as most people will here know, all Persian poets write uh, under a pseudonym. And Jahan wrote under the name Jahan, uh, which means world. And she very often puts the word world in the end of her poems. And you might think, well, this is rather grandiose. It's rather showing off. But in fact, it's always a world that's been destroyed or a world that's in tears or a world that's joking, joking, uh, that broken. She, she, she jokes with her name. She puns on her name. And it's almost as if she's dissolving into something else at the end of the poem. She seems to be withdrawing from the poem at the end. Or even as she says her name, she puns, and she's sort of not there. Jahan Khatun is noticeably humble compared with most other, other poets of her period. Well, I think I'm going to stop, I'm afraid, as we're coming to the end. I just wanted to say that finally we did have Nima Yushij who dared to yes. say that not all Iranians really do want all this, uh, you know, spiritual love and... Uh, immortal lover, and he addressed Hafiz to say, you know, Hafiz are in Czechy do Doruqis, ka zavane me or jame Oh, Hafiz, you know, go on all these lies from the mouths of the wine and the cupbearer. 
forever loving the immortal beloved man baru asheram ke ravandas i love she or he again we don't know who is mortal well Professor Davis, on Friday when we began introducing you, and of course you needed no introduction, you protested vehemently that you did not want to be eulogized and you no, did not want any praise, and all the shikas the nafsi. <laughs> and I think you have proved that really that was not a justified protest, and in, indeed you have just whetted our appetite, and we really want you to come back. In fact, we might just do continue to wish for further storms so you won't be able to fly back to <laughs> Ohio. It has been a, a real uh, pleasure. It's really, I certainly have lost track of time and it, you really made me want to go and explore so many other corners of this wealth of literature that we don't look at. And we're indebted to your writing and your beautiful delivery, which makes it so accessible while it lifts us to that elitist world where we feel we can also sup at the high table with the great and the good. Thank you very much indeed and please do come back and uh, I think I can speak on behalf of every single person here that we've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much.